Oh, hey, Mr. Bell. In today's video, we're going to talk about the most beautiful of all the gods in the Greek and Roman pantheon. You mean Kratos, the god killer? No, not Kratos, the god killer, Mr. Bell. We're going to talk about the goddess Venus. She was known as the childhood friend of Athena, Pallas. She is none other than the most beautiful goddess, Aphrodite. Oh, I have such a crush on her. Well, I'm glad you have a crush on her, Mr. Bill, because you get to meet her in this video. Yay! Yeah, you see, you're the only one on my characters that's actually made of clay, like our proto-Earth planet. And so you get to play the Earth today, and Venus happened to have a big crush on the Earth. She did? Hey, Gumby's made out of clay. Indeed, indeed. So to set things up, what we're going to do is we've got Jorge down here on the shelf below you, because that's where Mars was in a position below the earth. So you get to be the earth and Jorge down here is your Mars. Hey yo, Mr. Bell, big fan of your work. I do my own stunts too. Oh my God, is he throwing off lightning bolts? Okay. Now the scar of the earth, however, is in the Northern hemisphere of the earth, which means that Venus was above us. Uh, okay. And so for Venus, we're gonna use Kenny up above. I'm a big fan of your work, Mr. Bell. No, 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 man. She's huge. She's going to crush me. Nonsense. The Lion King has worked through the matter and everything is just fine. The sky is definitely not falling. That's not what you've been saying for years. <laughs> what does the name tell us? Where do we find Venus? And what actions did Venus take? Shall be the fulcrum for our analysis today. Don't forget to click that like, share, and subscribe button, Mr. Bell. And hold on for Mythology 109, Venus the Palas. Dazed and confused, dude. Oh, wow, if this stunt doesn't get me on Steve O's wild ride, I don't know what will. Oh! oh, hey, baby. I want to start by clearing the air around the dazed and confused state of our subject today, Venus, also known as Palas and Aphrodite in Greek and Roman mythology. You see, the confusion comes from the fact that several other characters in Greek mythology also go by the name Pallas, and most of them are male. There's the male giant Pallas, and then there is the male titan Pallas, who is the god of Warcraft. And yet, Pallas the giant, Pallas the titan, and Pallas the little girl that grew up with Athena are all the same character, and their stories are describing the same event. We know this because all the Pallas come from a lineage of our mother Gaia, meaning the material to form the proto-Venus came from the surface of the Earth. One of the more likely processes to create an electrode from the Earth is called coronal charging, and we'll get to that in a moment. But to get there, we need to break apart a few of the names Venus goes by to get some context on what kind of electrode the planet Venus was. By doing so, we can finally put all the characters in their proper positions so that the story of the collapse makes scientific sense as well as mythological sense. And it does. When these guys mythologized, they knew what they were doing. Then in Latin simply means come, which is an apt description of a negative charge. Things come to it. This electrical designation in the first position means that fundamentally Venus is electric and therefore the character should be male, as found in the male Pallas stories. So why is Venus a female? It has to do with recognizing her negative internal polarity, called the space charge. Negative is a feminine energy, and thus a female character is appropriate to that story. The male and female designation is supported by the rules of a compound language. In a compound language, changing a case can radically change a meaning of a word by going from a proper to a common noun. As a proper noun, then a Venus with a capital V can indicate male or female. And so as a proper character representing a single planet, we are well within the rules of a compound language to ascribe a feminine negative charge to a female character named Venus. However, if you were to write the name Venus with a small V as in a thing, it is considered masculine or rather, male, meaning a Venus is fundamentally electric. In this way, the small v Venus is correct as a male electrical designation, but in the story about a specific planet, a big v Venus 
it can indicate the negative charge and then will align with the rest of the story elements. Compound languages are kind of cool. The Us of Venus simply follows the same Zeus naming conventions we found in Mythology 101, using the octopi and octopus analogy. There are many octopi in the ocean. There is a story of an octopus on the playground. There are many veni in the solar system. There is a story of a Venus on the playground. Hey everybody, don't forget to click subscribe. Anytime you see the us, it generally indicates something that is repeatable. Or if you look at it from Hindu mythology, things like Shiva have incarnations or reincarnations. They happen more than once. There have been many Zeus in our history, and there are more than one Veni in our solar system. The same dynamic exists in the name Palas. In Mythology 106, we looked at the Hindu name for Mars, which is Mengal. Man is male and electric, and Gal is female, meaning there was a magnetic field. Quite similarly, Pal is male and therefore electric, and Lass is female, meaning there was a magnetic field. Mangal, Palas. Mangal had a positive internal space charge, and Palas had a negative internal space charge. We're going to come back to the Palas name in a moment when we take a look at where we find Venus. But the important takeaway here is that they were both electrodes, but of opposing charges, positive and negative. The name Aphrodite offers us the best visual picture of the protoplanet Venus yet because Afro and Afro are cognate. That is, the Afro as seen on the left is the same shape as the head of a negative charge as seen on the right, and that's why they're both named the same. The Afro of Aphrodite is a description of the negatively charged ball that made up Venus's internal space charge. Di means two, and T means U, and so I might suggest this is pointing at the cellular space electrode that has internal bipolar charges. This type of electrode has characteristics that mimic ferroelectrodes, making it a perfect partner to sit opposite Mars. In the middle rested the Earth, a negatively charged oriented dipole electrode, with polarities in the same position that they are in today, positive in the south and negative in the north. Because like polarities repel, the negative space charge of Venus and the northern half of the Earth prevented a collision. Mars was below us, matching the positive polarity of our southern hemisphere, preventing it from collision with the Earth. Now, if opposites repel, why didn't the planets continue to drift off? There is an answer in mythology, and it takes us to the question of where do we find Venus? Venus is born from the severed testicles of Uranus after they were cut off and thrown into the sea. The severed testicles being described are Mars and the Earth at birth, as described in Mythology 106. The Acts of Hephaestus, or the Rebellion of Pemba, are both describing the release of the two spheres, twins even. There is a description of a dropping down of Mars, where he took his placenta Athena with him. Venus is born of these two severed testicles because eventually Mars would slow down and turn back around towards the natural attraction to a negative charge. This would cause a collision between a positive Mars and a negative Earth in the southern hemisphere. Out of the northern hemisphere, the Memristive Tower formed Aphrodite in a Shizus, which means the natural flow of current must have been north to south, but due to the collision, it reversed for a brief period, forming a Shizus, causing a coronal charging to occur at the North Pole. All of this detail is found encapsulated in the painting by Sandra Botticelli. The clamshell is the coronal charge that formed the protoplanet, which is why Aphrodite is standing on it and not on the ground or in the sky. The man and woman on the left represent the positive and negative polarity of the current. They may represent Zeus and Hera. Note how the male positive charge is the only one blowing, and the woman 
is clinging to the man. Male is the positive polarity moving out, and female is the negative polarity pulling in. On the right is the character Aura, getting ready to dress Aphrodite. But look more closely and you will see that she is barefoot and standing on the ground. Aura represents the mother or grandmother Gaia, as told in the various Palas mythology, and described earlier as the formation material of a protoplanet Venus. Gaia is the material that makes up the surface of the Earth. Aura is preparing to dress Aphrodite. Once Aphrodite is formed, the sea foam represents the positively charged plasma clouds that were then floating around and began to be attracted to and form the surface of Venus. This sea foam and other myths is known as Venus's husband, the ugly and misshapen child of Hera, Hephaestus. Aphrodite was very beautiful. She was very attractive. The algebra of the matter supports the model and is interesting to explore briefly if nothing else. Negative by negative equals positive. Positive by negative equals negative. Everything was in balance. And so in mythology, Venus and Mars had a child called Harmonia. Some stories name the child Hermaphroditus, the merging of the male and the female force. The jilted husband of Venus, Hephaestus, however, gave Venus and Mars a gift for their wedding in the form of a necklace called the Necklace of Harmonia, representing the balance the two bodies formed. Let's not forget where necklaces go. They go around the neck. Oh, yay! Hey, wait a minute. Isn't this thing cursed? The next action taken by Venus in our story is that she gets raped by Poseidon and falls from the temple of Athena. Temple, meaning Venus was above the earth and began to fall down. I thought the Lion King said everything was going to be fine. He might have been a lion. What actions did Venus the Pallas take? The raping of Venus by Neptune or Poseidon meant the negative polarity of the internal space charge that attracted the sea foam around it began to neutralize the negative internal space charge. Over a long period of time, a coating occurred as described in the new creation tradition on not just the planet Earth, but the planet Venus and Mars as well. This coating or layering is seen in the striated layers of all three now metamorphized planets rock crust. When the overall polarity of Venus became positive in relation to the Earth, the sky began to fall. Slowly at first, then all at once. In many different tales, Venus the Pallas is flayed and Athena wears her skin. While this sounds horrifying and gruesome, it means that as near impact occurred and the Earth expanded creating the Indian and Pacific Ocean to store the charge internally, it sucked the positive surface charge and material from Venus like a vacuum and used it to coat the floor of the expanding oceanic rift. The heat and energy of the event gives the rock the appearance of being relatively benign and terrestrial crustal material in origin, but it is in fact the surface material of Venus. The epicenter of the crustal exchange is also evident in the rim of the Himalayan mountain chain. Athena flayed Pallas and wears his skin as a trophy. Pal of Pallas in Latin, by the way, means covering or cloak, but can also mean gloom. What would be more gloomy than the coming apocalypse with Venus and the flaying of her skin? Hey, Mr. Bill, I mean, Athena, my name is Pallas. I am the god of Warcraft, and I am coming to visit you soon. Don't make me angry, Mr. Pallas. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. By talking about the gray surface of Venus, we're really only grazing the surface of the Venus mythology. There's one more detail to cover that drives the nail straight through the heart of the matter, and that is the question, why is Athena, which is the Earth's core, sometimes called Athena Pallas? Well, it really has to do with the Titan Pallas, who is the god of Warcraft. Let me explain. Now, I wasted the better part of a decade myself playing World of Warcraft, and in that game, as with most, you quickly realize that Warcraft is about equipment. As the god of Warcraft, Pallas is a type of equipment used in war, 
and not always a specific warrior like Athena. When Athena, the goddess of war, gets hit by Mars, it creates Venus the Pallas in a Shizus, storing the load in a memristive ball. The ability for Athena to produce a memristive ball is the Warcraft tool, because it is how oriented dipole electrites protect themselves. They spit out a memristive ball like the Earth did when hit by Mars, producing Venus. When Venus finally falls back into the Earth, it creates another Zeus in the opposite direction, forming the Moon. The Moon is a Pallas. Thus, Athena Pallas is a description of the Earth and Moon. Athena Pallas. This is the Egyptian god of the Moon, Khonshu. Notice how Khonshu's staff encodes the coronal charging that formed the Moon. His staff is not an effigy to a crescent moon. It is an effigy to the coronal charting that formed it. The hollow face of the god tells us that the moon is hollow and represents something once living and now dead. Venus was living, but the Pallas is now dead. The new Pallas is situated at 90 degrees to the original Pallas in both polarity and orientation. The beak and the hair of Venus are synonymous in their electromagnetic orientation and connection to the Earth, one once from the North living and one now, at a right angle, dead. The dead Khonshu, however, healed the Earth. That is, Khonshu began rotating around the Earth, restarting the weather by creating high and low patterns. Now that we have a basis for Venus established, we can look at the full picture of the solar system to determine what happened and why. There are so many more connections dead ahead that will bring us to the final story of our true past, the one that had a very artificial intelligence start and then a very abrupt apocalyptic interruption. Never before has so clear a picture been lifted from the mythology of our world. Don't forget to click that like, share, and subscribe button and leave me your thoughts in the comments down below. Peace out.